Um, if you have your Bibles with you or you could uh, get a Bible from the pew in front of you, we're going to continue in our study in the book of Ephesians. So for those of you who need a page number uh, in the Bible pew, it would be 976. And we're in a kind of a mini series as we're walking through this first chapter of Ephesians on how our identity in Christ impacts everything about us. And if you remember, when we speak of identity, we're talking about our relationship with Jesus. When, when our first way we see ourselves is in relationship with him, it radically changes everything about us. Ephesians 1 is just packed with theological truth to remind us of what we become when we put our faith in him. When we put our faith in Jesus, through whom we now have a loving, personal relationship with God, our way of looking at the world and ourself should change radically. We will not see money the same way. We'll not see our health the same way. We'll not see relationships around us the same way. We'll not see the world that is often in chaos around us the same way. It shifts the axis of our thinking so dramatically that we now see things with a different lens. So far, if you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, this is all review. Now, so far we saw from verse 2 that each of us, when we put our faith in Jesus, become saints. Now, I know we talked about how difficult that is for us to accept and receive. But remember, we don't make ourselves saints. We address the the absurd doctrine of that somehow through good works we become saints. No, that's not the idea here. We're set apart by God through our relationship with Jesus. In verse 3, we also saw that as believers in Christ, we are now recipients of his grace and love. Grace unto salvation, for it's by grace you've been saved, but also grace to help us in our day-to-day living, which often becomes so difficult, doesn't it? But not just grace, but peace. And the idea of peace here is not just peace with ourselves within, but peace in the realm of relationships with others, and most importantly, peace with God. As the text continues to march forward, we saw last week how the Apostle Paul pressed forward to remind us of who we are, that when we are in Christ, we become worshipers of God. Look at verse uh, 3. Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is an expression of worship. We worship Because through Christ, we know that, look at verse 4 and 5, has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, declared us holy and blameless, and has a destination for us as children of God. To all that, the Apostle Paul then sums it up, this little mini section, verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which God has blessed us, in his beloved son. That's Jesus. This week we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. So if you have your Bibles, if you could stand with me, and we're going to read this together. Verse 7, picking it up in verse 7, it says this, In him we... And I should also insert also, because he's, he's packing it on. He's, he's really telling us everything we are in Christ. In him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven 
and things on earth. Father, we praise you for this text. And we're asking that your Holy Spirit would have free reign in our hearts to bring transformation and light to our eyes that, again, we may be deeply anchored in the truth of what we've become when we put our faith in Jesus. Thank you for all these truths, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's basically, you may be seated, there's basically two truths I want us to see in verses 7 through 10. The first is we're forgiven of our sin and redeemed through the blood of Jesus. We're forgiven of our sin and redeemed through the blood of Jesus. I think Psalm 103, 12 sums it up best when we trust in Jesus. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. That is what happens when we put our faith in Jesus. We will also look at redemption, how God bought us, redeemed us from the slavery of sin to be in relationship with him. The second truth I want us to see is how God has made known to us the truth has made known to us truth through the word of God, through the gospel that was previously hidden to us. Uh, It's so important to remember that before Christ, we were blind to the truth and reality of the way things are. It's important to realize that as before we were in Christ, we were darkened in our understanding. This is Ephesians chapter 4 now. Blind to the truth without the knowledge of God. But now God has made known to us the mystery of his will. This means it's not a mystery no longer. 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that the natural man, that's all of us before Christ, do not know truth. They do not know. But when we believe in Jesus, the spirit of God reveals truth to us what the truth is. Listen to how Paul put it in in Corinthians. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And then he says this in verse 16, but we have the mind of Christ. Praise God. Praise God. So let's look at these truths together. Our identity in Christ, redeemed and forgiven. I I could just stay here all day. You know, our standing before God, before we trust in Jesus, Christ is guilty. We are guilty on two fronts. First, we are guilty along with all mankind because all of us were born with a sin nature. A disposition, if you will, against the things of God. The doctrine uh, of this sin nature that we all were born with is called the, uh, the fancy word imputation of the Adamic nature. How's that for a, a mouthful, huh? Yeah. To break that down simply means that when the first man, Adam, sinned, all of us inherited this fallen nature and we and Adam have sinned or his sin was imputed to us. Romans 5.12 says, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. I mean, we feel the fear and the threat of COVID, don't we? We wear our masks. We try to do our best at social distancing and all these things that are involved because we're afraid that if we were perhaps to To get it or to pass it on, it it could be of a danger to others. Yet the the biggest danger on mankind is this sin nature which makes all of us stand guilty before God, alienated from God, away from him. The second reason that we're guilty is because of our sin nature, we do sinful things. You, you, You might say, well, Pastor Joe, speak for yourself. Remember what I always say. I, I, don't, I don't think I repeated this in a few years. If you, 
a few months. If, if you think that you are sin-free, please come and see one of the pastors and we'll clinically uh, <laughs> diagnose you with narcissism. We all do sinful things. We're naturally predisposed to sins like jealousy, uh, unforgiveness, lust, greed, indifference, laziness, addictions, gluttony, selfishness, hatred, and the list goes on and on. Again, going back to Romans chapter 3, speaking of all mankind now, this is the Apostle Paul. He says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God, all have turned aside. And then Paul sums up his argument really in verse 23 of that chapter, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we are guilty on two fronts. We have the sin nature imputed to us, but we also uh, do sinful things because we are naturally disposed to, to sin. Now, Religion and politics try to remedy these two things in their own way. Apart, we're talking about apart from God's word, apart from the revelation of Christ. Religion, the remedy that, that is put forward, whether it be Hinduism, Islam, or deviant forms of Christianity, is that somehow through good works that I could save myself and atone, so to speak, through my good behavior. False says the word of God. Po- politics has another way of, of dealing with this, whether it be the system of Marxism, socialism, or whatever system that's out there. The idea that man somehow through his own effort can reach some kind of utopian uh, ideal. And uh, we see how well that's worked out for Venezuela. And we should be in prayer for that country that's in deep deep darkness. And so religion and politics is not the answer. The answer, according to the word of God, is a relationship with God through Christ. Going back to Ephesians 1 through 1, 7, in Christ we have forgiveness of our trespasses according to riches of grace. And then he says this, redemption through his blood. Now, this word redemption is a beautiful, beautiful word. Redemption means to purchase on behalf of another. It was a word used in the ancient world when to describe when a person would purchase a slave's freedom. It was an exchange where a price would be arranged by the slave's owner and then paid by the one who was setting the slave free. That's exactly what Jesus does for us. It's a perfect picture of what he does for us. Before Jesus, we're all slaves to sin, bondage to sin. Before Christ, we stood guilty before God with the full consequence of condemnation. But now through Christ's shed blood, the price has been paid full that we may have relation with God and be set free. The freedom has several aspects to it. First, it's freedom from eternal condemnation. Instead of hell, we receive heaven. Praise God. I hope you're praising God for that. Because by the way, uh, I've talked to many people about this. Our minds can only go there for even a few seconds, and it's just horrifying thought. To be eternally separated from everything good, it should shake us to our bones and appreciate what we have in Christ. Instead of eternity from God, we now, through Christ, will be with him forever and ever. Another aspect of this freedom is from sin itself. Instead of being mastered by our sin nature, we have a new nature. That's what it means to be born again. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us. And now this new nature gives us a disposition towards righteousness. Now, now it's not something that happens all at once. It's something that happens as we learn to abide in. In him, we discover increasing power and victory to no longer walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Listen to how, again, Paul puts it in Romans 6. He says, when you are slaves of sin, you are free in regard to righteousness. But now that you've been set free from sin, you become slaves 
to God. I love that. There's a story I read several years ago in the Daily Bread that helps us understand this great metaphor of redemption. There was a young boy who built this beautiful uh, toy boat, model boat, spent months on it. And uh, he goes to the stream to, to let it kind of see how it, it functions in the water. And it gets away from him and he loses the boat. Well, several months later, he's walking by a store window in, in downtown in the city lived, and he sees the boat. He runs in to the owner of the shop and he says, that's my boat. And the shop owner said that he could have it back, but he would have to pay $1. The boy ran home, counted out his change from the piggy bank and returned back to the store, bought his boat back. Then the story ends with this quote by the little boy. Now you're twice mine. First I made you, now I bought you. That's what Jesus does for us. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, loved us so much that he poured out his life for us that we may have a relationship with him. So our identity is first to be redeemed and forgiven. As the text continues on, look at verses 8 through 10. Our identity is also a people who know the truth. A people who know the truth. When we turn to Christ, we read in verse 9, he makes known to us the mystery of his will. This should not be a small little detail in the text for you because uh, we are bearers of truth, we know the truth, and we abide in truth. And in these verses, I want us to, to first see the doctrine of what is called another fancy theological term, illumination. Illumination. Which means for our hearts and minds to know the truth of the gospel. And then the text in verses 9 and 10 give us four incredible aspects or results of this revelation. So let's look at these together. Illumination. In Ephesians 4.18, it describes us again this way. We're darkened in our understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in us. You know, most people do not see themselves as ignorant and darkened in their understanding. The most people I talk, they think they, their opinions, uh, they state without absolute certainty. I talk to many people about the things of God, and often they'll say, well, you know, that the most common response in our culture is, well, that's your version of truth. No, it's, really, it's not. I, I was just a burnt out, you know, some of you know my story, I was just a burnt out hippie kind of chasing new age philosophy before I came to Christ. No, no, that's not the disposition that, that you have your truth and I have one. That's, that's called relativism, no. If you look on the news, one of the reasons that these news anchors get paid so much money, they're literally called talking heads. And when you listen to them, they have strong opinions about things, whether it be on the left or the right. And so millions and millions of people every night will tune into the news and, and their hearts will rise and fall and rise and fall on all the fears that are being broadcasted with little hope, by the way. No, we're darkened in our understanding. But listen to the way 2 Corinthians describes it. He says, if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing for the God of this world, that's Satan, has blinded the mind of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of God. It is an impossibility without, without the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit to see truth. I can't just squat and just squinch and say, I really want to know. No, I need a work from God himself in me to see truth. This is, again, where man and religion fail. Uh, it, within Hinduism, I, I remember I spent 10 years in India. I spent many hours discussing with various pundits and gurus who believed if they just sat still 
for many hours, quietly, silently. This is basically the doctrines within Buddhism and Hinduism that somehow there will be what is called self-realization. The premise behind it is that somehow within the heart of man, there already is truth. Or the Muslim who believes that the Quran, which is a, a deviation of what the scripture teaches, is somehow the fount of truth. In both cases, they mislead man from understanding the mystery of God's will, the gospel. So how do we go from a place of darkness and blindness and ignorance to a place of light? Simple answer is the preaching of God's word. Listen again to Romans. Paul in Romans 10 puts it this way. How then shall they believe in him who they've not heard? And how will they hear unless someone preaches? And how will they preach unless they are sent? And he says this, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. This is why Jesus repeatedly said, he who has ears, let him hear. The idea is that when we allow ourselves to receive, something amazing happens that God, in a mysterious, tremendous way, through his spirit, begins to work so our minds and hearts can understand reality and truth. I like uh, the way Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 3. Listen to this. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Praise God. We're all blind. I'll tell you what. I was walking around like truly blind. But when, when you turn to the Lord, that veil is removed. Listen to how he describes it. And this is from the Lord who is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And then what is freedom from what? Ignorance. Freedom from darkness. Freedom from sin from condemnation to the gospel. The gospel is that we may see things that really are and be saved. Jesus in John chapter 8 put it this way. If anyone is my disciple and he abides in my word, he'll know the truth. And the truth will do what? Set you free. I don't know where your hearts are this morning, but if you are looking to this world for hope, you're looking for this, to this world for answers, you're going to come up empty every time. Because the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, has declared to us what is true. Now, verses 8 through 10 give us four amazing results of this revelation to us. I mean, they're amazing when you start to think about it. Look at verse 8. The first thing is he's lavished on us these truths with all wisdom and insight. You know, when I see all in Scripture, what does all mean? Does that mean God is withholding? No. No. He's given us everything we need. In fact, the word lavish in the, the original language means this. I was reading, reading it in Strong's Concordance. To exceed a fixed number of measure beyond expected. I love that. God's wisdom, insight to us of understanding is beyond measure. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? And the answer is no one. For from him and to him and through him are all things. You know, I, when I was a young boy, I used to love going down to the Carvel on Ocean Avenue in Long Branch where I grew up. And you know, when you're a young boy and you save up your money, you're very aware of when the cone has reached beyond what it should or under what it should. And there's not really much power you have. It's all at the discretion of the person who's you know, doing the cone. And, you know, when it was just meager and stuff, I'd be like, really? Hey, you know, that's not lavishing at all. But I loved it when it's all of a sudden, wait a minute, you're expecting like three or four inches on a small cone, and she decides to top it out, usually it was a girl, six inches. I'm like, yes, this is a great day for ice cream cones, right? 
Do you realize that's what the Lord has done for us? He's lavished on us truth. You, you can't say, you know, God, you've shortchanged me in understanding. No, if you're shortchanged, it's because you're unable to spend time to see. But if your eyes are open to see, you will experience the lavishing. What do you think, Pastor Mike? Doesn't he lavish it on? Yeah. Second thing is, he does this in accordance with the purpose of his will, which he set forth in Christ. I like the way the King James Version puts it, which he purposed in himself. Remember, God in eternity past planned this redemption. Remember verse 4, before the foundations of the world to make known to us through Christ God's salvation. And now, in accordance with the purpose of his will, he's made it known to us. It's about knowing truth. Remember what Pontius Pilate, who really looked at Jesus from a political point of view, he's, he was trying to see this as a political power gambit. And Pilate asked, are you the king? And I love Jesus' response. He says, for this reason I was born and came into the world to bear witness to the truth. John 14 tells us he is the way, the truth, and the life. The idea of the fullness of time, let's see if I'm, oh, well, look at that. I didn't even turn the page over. There's a whole other page. I'm ready to skip it forward. I said, that doesn't seem right. Third, The third uh, consequence of knowing truth is it's a plan of God realized. A plan for the fullness of time, verse 10. You know, this phrase alerts us to his amazing truth we find in the Bible. We find from the first chapters of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, a plan of God being revealed to us. But the question is, is when, was, when did it consummate? When did it reach its fullness? When was it completely realized? Well, it's realized in Jesus. It's realized in Jesus. You know, it, the Gospel of John's an interesting study because <laughs> on five different occasions, Jesus or the Word of God says, either my time has not come or his time has not come. But then at the end of the book, hours before he would go to the cross, Jesus himself would say, my time has come. John chapter 7 it's interesting, after his brothers were egging him on to reveal himself as the Messiah in Jerusalem during the Feast of Booths, Jesus says, my time has not yet come. He says it twice to them. John recorded that even his brothers didn't believe in him. So they were hoping that he would do some kind of miracle. Even his own brothers, two of which became writers of the Bible, James and Jude. So they came to their senses down the road. But his time had not come. Now, when the religious leaders at that feast tried to arrest him, they couldn't because the text tells us in John 7.30 that his time had not come yet come. In John 8, after teaching, I am the light of the world, they tried to arrest him again and again. They couldn't. And it says his time had not yet come. And then in John 13 and 17, in his great prayer, to the Father. Now the time has come. And that time was to be found in Christ through the cross. That is the consummation of all things that the Lord planned on our behalf. That we may have redemption, the forgiveness of sin, and the revelation of truth. Listen to the way 1 Peter chapter 1 puts it. Verses 10 and 11, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, 
inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when the spirit predicted the suffering of Christ. He's talking about Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all the prophets. This fullness of time, Peter addresses again in verse 20 of that first chapter. He says, he, Jesus, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest or revealed in the last times for your sake. I know it's a long teaching hour, but at least can I get a hallelujah, amen, and praise the Lord for that. Let's not be too Baptist now. Let's get a little Pentecost on this one. Because I'm telling you, if you're not excited about it, then you need a heart check. I'm going to temper- get the temperature reader out, uh, Deacon John. Fullness of time. He was, who died for our sins was buried and raised on the third day. Listen to the way John put it in his first letter. He says, this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and that life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. I mean, some of these texts I'm giving you today blow a big gaping hole, hole in the doctrine of universalism. I don't know how you can read these and, and come to that point of view. You either have to discard the scripture or come up with your own strange interpretation. That's all I can say. So four truths revealed. Nine and ten. He lavished on us the truths of salvation. Praise God. Not according to man's will, but his will. Thirdly, in the fullness of time. That time is now, by the way. That time is now. And then finally... This is the, the truth that's going to, this might blow a few, you know, I might see some hemorrhaging in the ears after this one, maybe. To unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. W- what's he talking about here? Do you know the miracle of all nations, all languages, all tribes, all peoples hearing the gospel and putting their faith in Jesus. I remember when my wife and I stumbled into this small village in India 30 years ago. Little did we know that the declaring the truth of God's word would result in over 50 houses, groups, and thousands of people who came to Christ. We could not anticipate it. It wasn't anything we did. The Spirit of God. These were Hindus who had God shelves in bondage to fear. Some of our stories is like that, right? In bondage to fear. God is the God who unites and brings all people. This is one of the themes, by the way, in Ephesians chapter 2. God reconciling both Jew and all nations, Gentile, bringing peace through the cross, Ephesians 3, 9, to bring the light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Praise God. This verse, Ephesians 1, 10, we see a picture of the fulfillment that we know about in Revelation chapter 19. And this is where we'll finish. I'm going to call the worship team forward. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. Listen to this. John, the apostles recording it. I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude. Now we know, as we read through the book of Revelation, this is all those who came to faith in Christ, and they would be a multitude. 
Well, what did that voice sound like? Tell you what, it's going to be a little louder than this worship service, I'll tell you that. (laughs) Like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out. What are they crying out? Hallelujah. That's like praise God. God. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory praise god let's pray father we're so grateful for these scriptures such an encouragement in a world of darkness and ignorance lord may each of us leave encouraged and with the the mandate to be vessels of light and salt for your glory that others too may know the beauty of the sweet, sweet gospel that's been revealed to us in Jesus.